Hi, my name is Paul Backhaus, and I'm a developer advocate working on, uh, at Google, and I work on the open web, and especially Chrome DevTools. And later on stage with me will be Paul Irish and Seth Thompson. Together, we're going to talk about three things, authoring, application, and JavaScript. Uh, all those three things are categories that we cater to in DevTools. And we have a lot of improvements coming in 2016 and some of the ones that we added in the last couple of months. So I'm going to kick off this, uh, first of all, by saying that we're going to talk about the Weather Wonder app. This is an app that we've built, but it's not completely finished. It's a mobile-first, responsive, progressive web app. Um, and we want to do a few touches to it, and we have a few errors that we want to fix. So first off, there are a couple new things that we're showing that are not yet in beta and in stable. So please use Chrome Canary for the very brand new features, and uh, enable the DevTools experiments in Chrome Flags, and then head to the settings and uh, click on experiments to enable any experiment that we're showing. All right, let's start with authoring. So when I talk about authoring, I talk about the actual crafting of a website, not just debugging or front-end ops or performance optimi optimizations, but actually building the website. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about is the device mode. We've added the device mode more than a year ago, but uh, we did some heavy improvements recently uh, because of the mobile-first story that becomes ever more popular uh, with responsive design. Uh, we felt that it was kind of backwards that we were building a page first in desktop uh, with the Chrome DevTools, and then had to enable a mode that uh, is pretty overwhelming at times, so you want to disable it again sometimes. Um, and so instead of going desktop first, we wanted you to go mobile first and actually have that mode enabled and feel that it's fine to have it enabled. So how does it look like? Well, uh, same thing, uh, device mode toggle is in the sidebar here next to expect. And if you toggle it, you see a very streamlined UI that focuses on responsive design. So you resize freely, but you also have shortcuts that give you the most common mobile resolutions right there uh, under the actual line that extends. Now, you can also just manually change it. Um, and so that's the responsive story that's relatively easy to use and just figure out on the fly. If you want to go more advanced, you can also emulate a certain device. So for instance, in this case, I'm going to switch to the Nexus uh, 5X, yes? And as you can see, there's some Chrome that we emulate, but uh, it also shrinks our viewport to fit in everything on our device on our screen. I'm going to show you what that means and why that's useful in a bit. We can also trigger a certain Chrome UI. So for instance, the keyboards light up. We can go to landscape. And now it switches back to 100% because it realizes that the viewport has enough space to display it, as, display it as, at 100%. So that's device emulation. But you can go even one step further. And this is something we just added recently. Uh, you can Im immerse yourself with actual device art. So you can go to the settings and show the device frame of that device to uh, actually uh, give you a real impression of the actual device. Not only, that, not only that, you can capture a screenshot, and that screenshot includes the actual device frame. So you can share it with your, with your coworkers um, and uh, with your designers. Thank you. Now, you can also customize that mode. It's pretty bare bone in the first place, but you can edit the device list. We ship with a lot of configurations for all sorts of popular devices. Um, but we can also add a new one and just add a user agent string, some values in there. And uh, if you want to customize more, you can, add the, you can click the three little dots. And then, for instance, if you want to debug images, you go to the device pixel ratio. Um, if you want to simulate network throttling, you can do that in the network panel too. But sometimes you want to look at it in device mode. And so if you want to go offline, test offline functionality, or just a slow connection, you can do that right there. So that's customization, and there's more stuff. Now, I, I talked about mobile first, and that I want you to have that mode enabled. But some people have been asking, well, what about desktop? I mean, I still want to build desktop sites. Well, there's a very good story here, too, and something that's actually even, in my opinion, better than what we had before. Because of the zoom that I showed you before, we can now change the zoom level to something that's much smaller than the actual resolution. And the page still functions as before, but we can switch to a resolution that we don't even have on this device, on this actual laptop. Now, we can enable the device type. As you can see, it's now a touch device by default. But we can switch it back to desktop 
and now everything becomes selectable again. It's just a normal desktop you know, viewport again. But it has the whole responsive story. So now we're going to use that. Uh, we're also, also going to show media queries. And it turns out that my Weather Wonder app looks pretty crappy uh, on that resolution. And if I resize it, well, yes, it doesn't look exactly good. We are missing a media query. So let's add one. Now I'm going to add a media query at pr approximately right, right point. Uh, it's going to use Flexbox. I want to have the boxes next to each other. And if I switch back to Chrome here, I can see that that worked. I can resize my viewport again with the responsive handles. And, uh, and as you can see, the actual media query that's not used at the top fades out. So only the ones that are currently used are uh, highlighted. And if you want to see it in the DevTools, what I just did, I can right click, reveal in source code, and go to exactly the thing that I've written right there. So it's a really nice way to iterate on media queries. And that's the new device mode. Now, moving on, let's talk about colors. Now, we've added, we did a lot of improvements to the color picker recently. So if we're looking at the header right here, I can click on the color picker. And what's built in now are color palettes. The first one are the page colors. The page colors are generated from your CSS on the fly to just give you all options that you have in your actual CSS. But if I want to do custom colors, I can do that too. And any kind of color to the custom palette. And that's available across all of my uh, tabs. But then to me, my, my personal favorite is the material design palette, because those have really nice colors out of the box that I can choose for the header, and most of them will just look pretty good. So that's the color picker. But I actually think we can do a bit better than that, um, because this is 2016, and we have a new feature called CSS variables that's an emerging standard that we actually support in DevTools. So let's see how we can use that to add a dark theme to uh, uh, the night theme to our WeatherWonder app. So first, I'm going to paste some, to speed this up, I'm going to paste some variables into the HTML. Those are all CSS variables. Uh, as you can see, it actually is smart enough to realize that that's, that's a color that I have in there. It could be anything, right? But it's parsing it as a color. I can use the color picker. I'm going to change the variables uh, where they need to be changed. So in this case, on the header, I'm going to change uh, to the header color. Uh, I'm just going to speed it up a little. And uh, I'm going to use background color here, uh, card background color on the actual card. Uh, and then let's see, yes, that's missing. It's a faded color on the text. And I think we have final one. And uh, yeah, actually, coming back to the card, as you can see, there's no text color defined on the card. But we do have quick actions in the bottom now that are actually pretty nice to add a color to uh, a class right there. So you don't have to type in color or background anymore, and just can add it right there. Uh, so that's nice. I'm going to use it to just add the card text color here. OK. And now I'm going to switch back to the HTML tag uh, to actually create our dark theme. We just have, uh, that's just our preparation we've done. So I'm going to copy the block of CSS variables here. And then I'm going to use another new feature in the actions, the quick actions below, uh, the little plus that actually adds a new style rule right in that file uh, below the style rule at top. And I'm going to call it dark, going to paste it. And now I'm not going to use another new feature, which is the class toggle in the style panel. If I do that, I can insert a new class on that element. It applies directly. And I can even toggle that. I'm going to use that right, right a bit. So now I'm going to bring up the color pick again. And now, if I long press on one of those colors, uh, first of all, yeah, I'm going to choose. Yeah, let's do it. That blue is good. But if I lo long press on one of those colors, I can come to all of the shades of that color, which is a really nice way to just pick a palette that works nicely. So I'm going to use all sorts of shades of that same color to drive our theme here, um, which, which makes things so much easier for me. Um, and finally, the faded color. and. Uh, there we go. I think we have a pretty good dark theme. And now I can use that toggle right there to toggle the class on and off very easily. And this works for pre-existing classes as well on any element to preview what we have. So that's the color picker and the built-in actions. Thank you. Now, let's talk about animations. Now, in the best sense, animations are not just flashy things, but they will add 
uh, they will, for instance, visualize a state transition in a, in a really nice way. And if you're like most of, most of you uh, and, and me, uh, you don't usually, if you create a complex animation, it's not just one DOM element, but it's a set of DOM elements. So we thought long and hard what we can do here and how we can develop a solution that works well for an animation workflow. Now, I'm going to switch to a different demo here for a moment, because we don't have a lot of animations on the WeatherWonder app. Uh, this is actually a pretty cool demo, because this is a, a web prototype that actually is built from the Chrome team, by the Chrome team, and, uh, and um, um, is a UI prototype for the actual system UI. So we actually used that to build our system UI in Chrome. So let's take a look. But first thing, I'm going to take, uh, take a look at the URL bar, and it's going to bring up the keyboard. But the keyboard doesn't ease really nicely. Uh, I think the easing is pretty off. So I'm going to click on the keyboard. I'm going to bring up the new Bezier Curve Editor. So the Bezier Curve Editor allows you to quickly switch to any kind of easing curve that works. As you can see, we just improved it quite a lot by choosing a different easing curve. But again, this is a complex animation that consists of a group of elements. So I'm going to use the new animation inspector to capture those groups of animations. It's actually smart enough to figure out that what you're looking at is a complex animation that consists of various DOM elements. So now we can scrub in that animation uh, and go back and forth and look exactly at what I'm look check out exactly how it looks like. I can slow it down to give a, give it me an even better preview. But not only that, this is not just a preview. I can shift things around. I can add a delay to the keyboard and make it appear later. Here we go. <laughs> and now there's, there's a bunch of other animations in here, uh, back to full speed. Uh, I'm just going to click around a little. Uh, and there's, there's even more here. Uh, as you can see, all of that is captured in groups. Those groups even have screenshots that are animated, little GIFs that we capture. Um, and, uh, and so you can go to any of them and then click on it and just check out what I just recorded and uh, scrub back and forth. So we think that's a really nice improvement on working with animations. And that's animations. All right. So I already showed you quite a bit in a relatively short time. But when you, want a feature, when, you, when you want to find a new feature in DevTools, and I didn't detail every step to enable those features, um, if you're like me, you're sometimes lost. And you, you kind of search in the settings, you search something else. The DevTools are a fairly complex product. And uh, sometimes it's just not super easy to find something. So we have a solution to that too, we think. And we were inspired by Sublime Text here and a few other editors. And what we added is Command-Shift-P to bring up a command menu. So that command menu can really easily allow you to switch to any action, any panel, right on the fly, just on your keyboard. For instance, here showing the dark theme, or I could go offline right in the command menu without actually clicking anything. And I can also just, for instance, uh, yeah, go back online or um, show media queries in the device mode. So almost every category within DevTools is supported here. And uh, it includes over 60 actions, more are coming. Um, and we think it's a really nice way to, to jump around things and discover things. Now, I'm going to call up Paul Irish to talk about something that's brand new, so new that we need his computer to demo it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Nice. So we, um, we were hearing, well, yeah, first. My name is Paul. I work on uh, the Chrome DevTools. I'm going to show you a little bit more stuff. Um, Paul was showing you a bit about how we work with styles and some of the new tools to manipulate them. Um, and I want to dive into that a little bit more, because there's this gap between kind of the styles that we see in the DevTools and then kind of like how we write them. And we always have to kind of mentally map between things and kind of work it out. And it's always a little bit rough. We've been thinking about how to kind of smooth that over. All right, so I'm going to switch screens over here, bring this up. So I'm looking at the Weather Wonder app. Um, now, I'm going to make a change to my styles here. Um, I'm looking at just this header across the top. 
And it looks like we got this color, um, which looks pretty nice. I'm going to make a change. Uh, we'll switch it over to goldenrod, because I am like totally into goldenrod these days. Um, that looks good. Now, one thing that we've always actually done is being able to map what you're doing here in Elements Panel and then show you over in Sources kind of what it maps to. So if I click over here, um, we actually have the goldenrod kind of just carrying over right here. So it kind of already keeps track of things. But let's say I want to make a few more changes. Um, I'm going to get rid of this Z index. Um, and I'm going to tweak the font size just a tad. And I think that looks good. Now, one thing I want to make sure is just make sure that over here in my settings, I got everything I need to make this look as sharp as it should. All right. With that out of the way, um, we should be able to click in and make just uh, a few more modifications. That seems nice. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll tweak that back again. I'm feeling good about this. Feeling good. Yeah, all right. So uh, things are looking good to me so far. Um, any more things? Yeah, bottom border. Uh, border, bottom, one pixel, solid. Any color recommendations? Papaya whip, is that oh, coral? Coral? Is that a, yeah? I think coral. Ooh, that is nice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we'll give that. Yeah, so nice. All right, I'm into that. All right. So I'm going to drop over here. And one thing that you'll notice, not only are the changes there, but we're also making sure that uh, we've annotated alongside the changes to show you a little diff view of what is new down here and what has been changed. So this just keeps track of all the changes that you've done. Um, and even if I wanted to, say, for instance, get rid of something, um, I'm going to add a little bit of space up there. And turns out I actually don't need a background. Uh, no, I don't need these guys at all. Like, we'll just wipe them out. Um, we keep track of deletions, modifications, additions. So this is a nice way that we can kind of keep accounting for um, all of the things that have happened in the page. All right. So got those changes underway. Um, but it is true that I'm like switching back and forth between these. You see it kind of messed me up a little bit. Um, you kind of want to have that understanding here without switching contexts. So we're like, maybe we could just bring that information over into this view. So I'll show you a new, new panel, very, very new. Um, and it's down here near the console. Now you can click these uh, little dots uh, to reveal it. But I'm going to use the command menu because I'm just feeling it. So I'm going to type in quick source. So quick source is just like the sources panel, but with a little bit less. And now I have the exact same thing over there just in line here. And the nice thing of, about having this here is that as I click around in my positions in the styles, it's also going to make sure that it's jumping to those locations um, down in this area. So as I move around, I can kind of keep track of uh, my position between the two files. So this is giving me a lot more context for how what I'm doing in the Elements pane matches with my original source file, and so that I can like, take these changes and then carry them back very easily to what, the work that I was doing. So I feel good about this stuff. I like it. Um, but there's another thing that I want to show off, uh, because like, I'm showing this with CSS, right? Um, there's a lot of great tooling in here for CSS. But what we're authoring in and our projects is not necessarily CSS. It's usually something that compiles down to CSS, right? And so that's another kind of mapping that we have to make in our heads of like, OK, I made this over here, but I'm going to copy paste, and then I need to put it here and here. And, and it's a little bit of work. And so this has always been something that we wanted to kind of ease the transition for so that we can keep things a little bit in sync. So you might have, um, say, for instance, uh, used CSS source maps before. So I'm going to flip those on because I had uh, just turned them off for this part. Um, and I'm just going to reload the page, make sure that I'm looking good. That is nice. That is nice. But I'm going to uh, get rid of those goldenrod changes just for the moment. OK. So we'll bring this back. And good. So I've turned on CSS source maps, right? And if you've done this before, you might have noticed that over here on the side, it says loader CSS. Uh, looks, that's CSS, right? And so that's good because I can uh, click over and see, like, where is this selector? Where is this rule over in the uh, source? 
And so, yeah, OK, I guess it's over there. And this is my SAS file. Like, I have variables and mix-ins. OK. So this has been something that, is, that we've had for a little while. Now, just to ease things, I'll bring back quick source. Well, I'm going to go a little bit quicker here. Now, um, OK. So I'm making some changes. And uh, let's see. Yeah. So um, one new thing is that now that I have quick source and my map in place, not only can I uh, just follow around the position of, yes, background is there and position is there, but you can see as I click on the value for this color, it jumps up immediately here. So I get instantly get the feedback that these are actually coming from variables, whereas these are properties in this rule. I like this a lot because it gives me the context for like, what, what am I looking at here? Is this from a mix-in? These guys are from a mix-in. OK, good, good. OK, good. Now, this is all right. This is OK. Um, but like, our job is not just to look at the relationship between these things. Like, we got to do work. We got to like, you know, change how it looks, get some more goldenrod in there. You know? So let's change something. Um, I'm going to go in and uh, this background color again, uh, tweak it. It needs to be a bit more green. Open up my color picker, switch it over. So what we just did right here is this color <clears throat> green, we actually didn't just change it for the header. We changed the original color value here. Let's switch to red to make that a little bit more clear. Check this out. So not only did we change it for the variable value, but you can see we update all the places that are using that color. So not only the header, but you see that the footer, too, is using a variable for the same thing. So we're keeping it all in sync. And we think this is really, really cool. What do you think? You like it? I'm going to show you a few more things here. So now that it's OK, red is, red is a bit too much, I think. I don't know. The green was a better choice. Yeah, like a there. That's good. All right. So, uh, so we got the, um, we got our changes on, on variables, and that's working out nice. I'm going to make it a little bit more of a complicated change. We're going to go in here, and it looks like uh, this, these icons, right? Um, these icons we have with height. 32 pixels. And it looks like I left a comment for myself. I really wanted to update those to use a proper variable as well, just like this larger one. So I'm going to go in, and I'm just going to make the changes directly in here, because it's not really something that I can do up in the, up in the uh, styles. So we'll just update those. This becomes 32. And we drop in those guys right there. right? And we can get rid of this. Now, nice. My, my diff keeps up with me, keeps track of what I did. Now. Change my, my SAS file. I want to make sure that we can bring it into the project. Now, what I uh, could do is I could kind of copy it out of the page. I could also right click and just save this to disk. Um, but I have set up the workspaces functionality already, so I can just hit Command S. Um, now, before I do that, I want to point out I just have a gulp task sitting behind the browser window, just like a typical gulp task. It's just compiling when I save to disk. So when I save this file, it should kick in, um, and we should be good. So Command S. Yeah, cool. OK, so no visual changes uh, so far. Um, but let me just check one thing. I'm going to click in back onto the icon. And uh, we're looking like 32 up here. Ah, yeah, OK. So as I click on the 32 up here, it is mapping to this variable value. So does that mean that I can just update this guy? We'll go like to 60 pixels. And you see, not only does it update this, but also all uses. So we're keeping it all in sync. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, one other thing. Because we have not only the bidirectionality between CSS and the originally authored uh, styles, um, we also have this bidirectionality between my dev tools here and my editor. So I'm going to come over here and um, look for that icon size. And it looks like it's here. Uh, everything looks to be in place. And I'll tweak that and bring um, it back down to, let's see, uh, well, let's just shrink it down a lot, 10 pixels. Now, as it hits Save, the SAS should kick in. And there we go. So this is nice. I can edit up in the, up in the Styles pane up here. I can make changes in here. Or just come back in my editor. And we're going to keep it all in sync. All right. 
just so you guys know that this is real, uh, this is the uh, repository for my project. And I'm just going to hit git diff. And we're looking here at the diff of my SAS with my green. And I wiped out that thing. And so all these changes are now in my project uh, looking good. Cool. Um, so there's a bit of magic to pull this off. Like we're, we're kind of keeping track of things in different places, right, to, to, to make this work. Um, what's actually happening? I just want to kind of explain it. It's going to get a little nerdy. Um, this right here is a visualization of a source map. Now, source maps is the same thing from JavaScript and CSS. Now, uh, so what I have on the left is CSS, and on the right is a SAS file. So uh, this border color, for instance, you see these margin border color. It's just highlighting on the right-hand side what that maps to, what the source map knows about it. But you can see that the variable value over here is actually mapping, whoops, excuse me, uh, is mapping right there. So here you can kind of see what's happening. The mapping already kind of uh, helps us identify the different strings and how they, they fit to the other file. And so we're in the dev tools just using the, this information to allow us to kind of update uh, what would make sense. All right, um, so I should put out a disclaimer or two. Um, this uh, is really cool functionality, and we're, we're working on it um, still. Um, it works great with SAS, with all the things that you would expect it to, and variables and mix-ins and nesting and things like this. Um, we're talking with the teams behind Auto Prefixer, PostCSS, and SAS, uh, sorry, and Less, um, to make sure that things are working great with them. Because we want, we want to make sure that everybody has this kind of best-in-class styles editing experience. Um, so you can play with this uh, now, and we're making sure that it's going to be even more robust, regardless of how complex your, your style tool, tool chain becomes. Cool. All right, so with that out of the way, uh, I'm going to switch back here because um, I'm going to move on and kind of shift gears. We're going to talk a little bit about application development and specifically progressive web app uh, development. We've been working hard in uh, the DevTools to kind of bring some new uh, functionality that makes things a little bit more clear, because these things can get hairy. Now, uh, one of the things that we like to do in the DevTools is change things, like just change things. You thought it was over there. We moved it down there. Like, that's like what we're going for, right? Um, and we thought, you know, it might be nice if we um, just like change, like kind of remove one of the panels that you've been using, just it, make it disappear completely. Well, all right, we didn't totally remove it. But you'll notice there's no resources panel up at the top. Resources panel is now application, OK? So let me give you a quick preview of what application looks like. So there's still everything that we didn't remove anything. Everything's still here. Uh, storage and uh, your application cache and cache storage and frames. So you can still navigate that. But up at the top, we've done some new things. So uh, this right here is a visual representation of your manifest, of your web app manifest. So uh, everything, this is the, the actual JSON as it was received. But we've kind of parsed it out visually to make it a little bit more clear. So you can see your colors, um, your icons. And um, if you want to test what it looks like when Chrome prompts the user to see if they want to add this to their home screen, you can do that here. So it just would trigger the same thing that Chrome would be doing. And it looks like, actually, this one's not going to work because something about the display property in my manifest uh, isn't what it needs to be. So I'm getting that feedback uh, here about any errors and warnings that we're discovering far before I realize it just doesn't work on my phone. All right. So that's what it looks like for Manifest. Um, but when it comes to service workers, uh, we want to make sure that you're getting the information that you want. So there's been some functionality in here before, but it's been a little bit confusing. So we want to make sure that it's very clear how things work. So here I'm investigating my service workers. And um, I want to make uh, a few changes, but I also just want to see what's happening. So I, we have here a listing of um, the service worker that is attached to the page. Looks like it's up and running. Um, I'm really attracted to this checkbox around offline at the top. I'm going to click it. Now I'm going to reload the page. And um, looks like it, it went offline. That makes sense. But I thought I had a, I thought I would, like, was, it was, everything was offline. Everything was cached. I'm not really sure. Let me make sure that things are up and running. Yeah, this seems good. Pretty good. I mean, roughly good. Now, uh, I'm going to check that offline again. Reload. Yes, OK. We'll just ignore this down there. Um, 
<laughs> so the, I reloaded the page. The page is still up. This is what I expect, because this is a progressive web app without errors. And it is supposed to work offline, right? But if I, uh, on the right-hand side, if I unregister the service worker and I reload the page, I would expect to see our dinosaur friend. Yes. Good. Offline, no service worker, we're done. So this offline checkbox is the exact same thing that you're, you're used to over here um, with the network throttling. And it's just here conveniently for, for offline development. So um, I'm going to try out some more things. So I'm going to switch over in my editor to my service worker. And it looks like uh, I have some logs coming in for my service worker in a nice goldenrod yellow. Mm, it's so good. So what I've done is use some styled console logs, some quality, quality stuff. And I want to change the color. So I'm going to change it to blue. Um, and uh, I'll reload. And I see a little bit of it. I see some blue. And actually, so I have the, the one with the blue text is here. It's waiting to activate. But the goldenrod is still there. And I'm like, OK, cool. But I want blue. It's important. So I'm going to skip waiting. I'm going to force it to be the active one. Um, and so that's all good. But maybe I wanted to make another change. And so as I'm iterating on my service worker, um, it works. But then there's continuing to be waiting to activate. Because this is kind of the, the workflow and the life cycle of how they work. Because this gets a little annoying, um, the update on reload checkbox uh, allows me to basically always update the service worker definition whenever I reload the page. So that way, I don't have to go through and click this skip, skip waiting every single time. So as I change this uh, and save it and reload, it's just instantly pulling that one in, and I'm running the latest. So this is great for doing service worker development, for literally editing the service worker code. But there's other times when you have a page, um, and you're uh, playing around with the page's styles or its functionality, and you kind of want to just pretend like it's not being cached. So that is what this bypass for network checkbox is. It's pretty much the disable cache of the service worker generation. It's like just service worker, don't attempt to like overtake these, these requests and like provide one from the cache. Just ignore the service worker for all the network requests. And this allows me to make any changes um, for the page and just see it directly. All right. Um, sometimes you get in kind of interesting situations, and uh, you just want to you know, clear it all away. So the brand new clear storage uh, pane allows you to just take all of the service workers, the storage, the cache, and just wipe it. It wipes it just for this one domain, um, so you're pretty good. You're able to clear it out and kind of like start from fresh. All right, so feels good. Um, some, I wanted to show you one other thing. While you have this um, information available to you, kind of real time in manual debugging, you sometimes want um, uh, a little bit more information to help you guide you and, and make sure that you're hitting all the things that you need to. Um, and we've been thinking about how to bring this functionality. And we started a, a, a project that allows you to investigate kind of what is the checklist of items that you need to build a, a successful progressive web app. And so, um, so this is a project that we're calling Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is a standalone validator that allows you to identify what is necessary to build a progressive web app. And so what it does is it investigates all of the things in the page, looks at your service worker and your manifest and all sorts of things to identify what are the things that you haven't yet done. Um, so I want to show you a quick demo. And um, I just have up this uh, page. This is uh, Firefox's uh, page where they communicate about what, they, what features that they have. Um, but it's a progressive web app, and so I get to try it out. So I'm going to kick off the Lighthouse Chrome extension and generate a report. So what this is doing is it is uh, emulating a mobile device. It's actually throttling the network condition because it, so it can get more accurate network um, performance data. It is um, reloading the page and doing a lot of tests to understand uh, about the, how secure the page is, um, what is cached, um, if it redirects from HTTP to HTTPS, kind of all these things. It's running kind of a battery of tests, and it takes a few page loads to really get it right. But when it's done, <sighs> OK, good. Yes. All right. So this uh, is the report that you get. So this uh, report gives you an idea of uh, where you're hitting the mark and some places where there's opportunities. So it gives you information on um, if the page is successfully cached offline, if it has everything that it needs so that Chrome can prompt 
uh, repeat users to add it to their home screen? Is it going to launch off the home screen with a splash screen? Things like that. And even gets into things like um, accessibility, security, other UX issues. So it kind of tests a whole battery of things. Now, this is available here. We've prototyped um, ex ex uh, exposing this functionality through a Chrome extension, but it's also available on the command line. So over here, uh, this is just a, a command line module written in Node.js. And you can see this is the same kind of report just uh, here. So this is nice. We can also outport as JSON in case you want to run this in a continuous integration environment and make sure that there's no regressions across any of these variables. So um, this is a really exciting thing, and we're happy to kind of move it forward. It's still early days, and you can imagine have seen this thing in all sorts of different places in your development lifecycle, whether you want to see it in uh, the Chrome DevTools or available in, in continuous integration. Um, so we're working hard to, to find out the right places for it to live. So um, if this is of interest to you, uh, it's just on GitHub. And feel free to come by, get involved in the community. We're looking to expand the coverage, start getting into more testing and security and accessibility, gathering performance metrics. So I encourage you to drop by and check it out. All right. That was a lot. But Seth is going to help us out and take over the next part. Um, and I think he's going to tell us a little bit about JavaScript, debugging, good stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Good job, Bob. OK. Hi, everybody. Let's see. I think we're all set up here. OK. My name is Seth Thompson, and I'm a product manager on Chrome. I work on the DevTools team, but I also work on the V8 team. Now, V8 is Chrome's JavaScript engine. And today, I'm going to tell you about a project which spans both of these teams. So uh, Chrome DevTools is great for debugging your application. But normally, when we talk about using Chrome DevTools, we're talking about debugging the front end of your application. But many of you are web developers that are full stack engineers. And you're not just debugging a front end. You know, you're also interacting with the back end, which maybe exposes APIs that the app interacts with. So how many of you have seen this? This is so, so, so much of a hassle to get when you're in DevTools on the front end. It's a status code that shows that there's an error in the back end, which is returning uh, a request to Chrome and the front end. And what's, what's tough about this is when you see something like this, you often have to completely change mental context in your workflow. You have to leave Chrome DevTools working on the front end. You have to often uh, go over to another code base where your back end is running. You've probably got to kill your app, start up a debugger for the back end, make some changes there, try to identify what the problem is, restart your back end service, and then switch back to Chrome DevTools to uh, continue working from the front end with a fixed API call. But uh, let me ask you another question. How many of you guys are Node.js developers? OK, maybe have worked on some Node.js applications. Well, on Chrome, uh, we love Node.js. And so many web developers use both of these technologies together. So you know, Node.js is powered by the V8 JavaScript engine. And DevTools can introspect and debug V8 when it's running in Chrome. So we thought, why isn't it easier for DevTools to debug V8 in a JavaScript context in Node? Well, I'm really happy to announce that the, uh, as of this week, we've submitted a pull request to Node Core to integrate proper, out-of-the-box DevTools debugging of Node.js. So this is, a, this is a big deal. And it's been a collaboration of the Google Cloud Platform Node.js team, the Chrome DevTools team, and the Chrome V8 team, allowing you to use the binary that you're using to run your Node.js app and hook it up to Chrome DevTools. So the reason this is different, yes, it's a, it's, it's a really big, uh, it's, 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 it's going to be cool. Now, you may, have, you may be familiar with other uh, similar tools. There do exist UI tools for debugging Node.js, some of them even based on, on, on parts of DevTools. But the difference about this is when this, if, and hopefully, if this pull request is submitted into Node Core, uh, you will be able to use the exact same node binary that you're using to run your app already. And you'll also be able to use DevTools in any Chrome window. So 
This allows you to, it takes away all of the machinery between the node, server, and dev tools, and allows you to pick up immediately when either node or dev tools adds new features, new debugging context, new ways to introspect your app. So enough talk. Let me give you a quick demo here. Uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, the same screen you've been looking at before. And uh, I'm also working on some changes to the Weather Wonder app. It's actually a, it's a pretty complex app, and we need three, uh, three people working on it uh, with a bunch of different branches. Uh, it's going to be good when it's done. But um, you can see here, uh, I'm actually uh, working on adding a feature that humanizes the date. I think uh, in the version Paul was working on, you've got this long timestamp there. So I want to humanize that and say, put relative time. Um, now, Weather Wonder is architected right now as a progressive web app on the front end that makes uh, an API call to the back end to query for the updated weather content. And that back end is a Node.js app. So let me quickly show you that. Um, right here on the left side, I've got a gulp task running the front end progressive web app. And on the right side, I've just got this simple Node service running a quick back end that you know, requests the forecast data and, and responds with it. So uh, what I want to do, though, is, is I notice that there's an error here. And it says that my app was most recently updated 46 years ago, which is definitely not the case. None of these technologies were around 46 years ago. So there's definitely an error. And when I would, when I would be using uh, DevTools normally in the past and, and highlighting this, trying to figure out where that number's coming from, uh, I would hit, run into this, this place where you know, I, I query, for the, uh, query for the response here. And actually, I'm going to make one, um, one mention of something that came up earlier here. Because I'm debugging the back end and the front end, I don't care as much about the caching behavior of the progressive web app. So I'm going to come into the application panel and toggle bypass for network. This means that every time I refresh the page, it should hit the back end again with a new response and request. So now when I come to the network panel, I can come in and see my newyork.json on, uh, let's see, this was a request to localhost. That's where my node application is running. And I noticed in the, the preview here that the time is actually responding with the improper relative time from the back end. And previously, this would be the point where I've reached the boundary of DevTools. I have to switch into this other code base, this other, jo uh, this other JavaScript debugging context, different tools to try to track that down. But with this change, with this pull request, and I have a specially built uh, version of that pull request, but hopefully, if it's accepted, it would be the same binary you're using normally. My special build is called node2. I just pass a command line flag. That's it. Inspect. And after I do that, the exact same app gives me back a simple URL. I paste this in to DevTools or excuse me, to any Chrome window. This is just a new window here. And now I have a context which is showing me my Node application. This is so cool. This is totally new, and it's right available in Chrome right now. <laughs> yes, it's, it's great. And just to prove it to you, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly show you what we've got here. We've got all of the features you usually use in DevTools. You've got a console. To prove that this is actually Node.js, uh, I've got my global node object, and on it, and you might have done this to feature test what version of node you're using. You can go to process, environment, and uh, version. Oh, no, I think it's, uh, I guess we can test the V8 version. What's on here? Well, this is the other fun part. You get to see what this object has. Where is it? Version, that's it. V7.0.0, that is the most recent version of Node. So this is really cool. It's actually a Node uh, environment that you're debugging here. It says Node.js main context. We've also got the Sources panel. So the Sources panel is where you're probably used to debugging front-end JavaScript. And DevTools has added a bunch of new features to this recently. You have things like uh, async call stacks to be able to traverse the control flow of your application across asynchronous boundaries, like a set timeout. Uh, you've got proper support for ES6. I think I've got an arrow function in here uh, somewhere. Maybe not. Uh, we also add uh, inline values. You'll see that in a second when we step over things. So all of these features, I just want to reiterate, all of these features that we add to, to DevTools on the front end immediately work out of the box with Node.js when you're debugging on the back end. 
So as you can see here, I've set a breakpoint for, um, and actually, let me, let me go back up one more time. Um, that Java, the JSON I showed you was coming from this route here. And I've added a breakpoint on my back end where I have the logic for that route, city.json. And just that, I actually, it already happened. When I uh, re tried to request that JSON object, it hit my breakpoint that I set earlier. And uh, you can see here that what I really want to figure out is why my moment.js conversion isn't working. So stepping works like normal. You see that uh, data.currently.time, which is coming from this forecast uh, API, that does have a timestamp. And uh, I, I pass it through uh, this conversion using the moment node library to turn it into a relative time. But something's messing up there. Well, you know, what I really need here, because this data object that's coming back from the forecast API has so much stuff on it, I really want an interactive environment to see what's on that object. And the, uh, the console here actually updates and gives me the context of where my breakpoint is set. So if I type in moment, I've got my moment library. And if I type in data, I've got the response that was, came back from the forecast API on my back end here. So let's quickly figure out what was the issue here. Uh, Data.currently.time does indeed give me uh, the wrong thing. Actually, that's because it already went through the uh, step here. Let me uh, set the breakpoint one more time and hit it before I reach uh, the conversion. OK. Uh, let me set it a little bit earlier here. How about up there? Great. Continue that one and reload my response. OK. Did that go? Nope. Great. So hit this breakpoint here. I'm going to continue, or just going to step over that error and now I've, I've, this is the data object as it was returned by the forecast API. Data.currently.time has, nope, currently I spelled wrong. Has a timestamp. OK. Now here is an example of something that's usually really difficult to debug. Uh, I think the issue here is something around the fact that the timestamp coming back from my back end is different than a timestamp that the moment JavaScript library expects. Normally, uh, if, if I had to figure this out, you know, why is my back end timestamp different than my front end timestamp, it would be so hard. But because this is the same DevTools JavaScript console, I can just check and say, OK, well, date.now returns, uh, oh, uh, it's under, returns a slightly longer timestamp. I think what's going on here is the back end is returning a Unix timestamp, which is in seconds. And the front end is returning a JavaScript timestamp, which is in milliseconds. That makes sense. That would mean that the relative time is older than expected. The fix is actually pretty easy. It's just uh, multiplying the timestamp, the Unix timestamp, by 1,000 to convert it from seconds to milliseconds. Now, you'll see I did one other thing here. DevTools has live edit. This thing updates on the fly. And it actually hot reloads the function that I'm editing in DevTools into the node process. I don't have to kill my node server and restart it again. Multiply by 1,000. I think that should do it. I'm just going to hit Save. I'm going to remove my breakpoint, continue that execution. And I'm going to move back over to my front end, hit Refresh, cross our fingers. It fixed it a few seconds ago. Yeah. So as you can see, it's just, it's just so much faster to debug both of these environments with this combined and integrated support. So I'd like to thank all the teams who helped work on this. Um, you can uh, get access to it on a special build if you choose now. But we're crossing our fingers that the pull request is accepted by Node, and this works out of the box. And now I'll invite Paul Bacchus back up, back up at the stage to uh, give an outro. Thank you. Very brief wrap up. Uh, so we talked about authoring application in JavaScript. And uh, to make this really quick, device mode, command shift P, colors of variables, real time says and authoring. Uh, take a photo if you want to. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, we need to move on. Sorry. Uh, manifest service workers in storage. <laughs> and, uh, and we hopefully, you can see the recording afterwards. And also node and inline variables, ES6, black boxing. There's a couple of things we haven't shown. But that's about it. Uh, what's next? Check out our dev documentation. Follow us on Twitter on Chrome DevTools. And uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. Yeah.